Uh, good morning. It's great to see everyone here again this morning. Um, if you're visiting, welcome. I, too, am a visitor, um, although fairly frequently. It turns out I'm here about once a month. Um, and I can say, having been on that side of it, been a visitor here, um, the people really are glad that you're here, the, the church here, and they want to they wanna talk to you. They want to get to know you. So, um, so welcome, and it's so great to be able to be here to remember Jesus, to remember the sacrifice that he made for us, and to worship God. Um, when you think about Jesus, when you think about his teaching, if you were going to tell somebody, what did Jesus teach? Who was Jesus? What comes to your head? Something comes to mind. More than likely, when we think about Jesus, who he was, what he taught, a lot of times our minds go to the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and maybe beyond that, we think about some of the other New Testament writings, right, where Paul and Peter and some of the other apostles and writers would elaborate on what was accomplished in Jesus' death and his resurrection and what it looks like to follow him in today's world uh, and some of the details of his church. But the reality is that for this thing that we call the Bible, this collection of writings, most of it is the Old Testament. Um, and the reality is, is that it too had a whole lot to say about Jesus and who he was. As most of you know, the Old Testament foreshadowed many of the things that Jesus would establish and what he established and what was accomplished in his death. Jesus himself tells us in Luke chapter 24, verse 44 through 46, he gives us his conclusion about the Old Testament writings concerning what they had to say about this Messiah, which was for sure prophesied. About that, he says... It is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. That's Jesus' summary of the Old Testament. Now, I don't know about you. When you read the Old Testament, what do you think about? What well, ought to be this, right? I mean, ultimately, all things point to this. And if anyone ever knew the Old Testament scriptures, it was Jesus. And when he concludes what the Old Testament, what the prophets, and all of these things, but ultimately what they pointed to, it was Jesus. Things like the gospel would be for all people. This was a mystery to the Old Testament writers, is the idea that Paul uh, suggests in Ephesians 3, 6, but it's now been revealed. What mystery? Well, that Gentiles are fellow heirs now with God's promise. Things like the idea that salvation would be through faith and not of works which according to what Paul wrote about in Romans 4.21, was witnessed by the law and the prophets. These are Old Testament concepts too. Or that the scripture, that is the Old Testament scripture, foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That's the language that's used in Galatians 3.8. Even concerning the law, Torah, according to Hebrews 10.1, the law was only a shadow of the good things to come. Or the rank or the office of priests. Just the work of the priests, the work that they did in the service to God in the temple and the tabernacle. Um, according to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, this was a mere copy and shadow of the heavenly things. We could go on and on about this. We've talked about here uh, the priest king Melchizedek and how that related to the priest king Jesus. Uh, we could talk about Passover, Egyptian slavery, the bronze serpent that was lifted up by Moses, the temple. Many of these things, I've been here with you when we've discussed Old Testament concepts and how they pointed to Jesus and what he would establish. And today we're going to consider another. And it's this concept of the law written on the heart. It's an Old Testament concept for sure and one that is, it better characterize us today uh, to be a people of, um, that serve God in spirit. So I want you to think about what that means. <clears throat> we're going to read here in just a moment. We did in the scripture reading this morning. We're going to read in the Bible where it says that God's people are characterized by this. The law is written on their heart. So if someone comes, before we read it then, consider now for a second, if someone came and asked you, what does that mean, that the law is written on the heart? What would you tell them? Hopefully after the lesson this morning, well, this is what I want to consider. What do the scriptures have to say about this? Okay, so it was for sure spoken of by the major prophets. This is from our scripture reading this morning. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He says, I'll put my law within them, and it will be on their heart. There's another translation, the JPS Tanakh. Instead of saying, 
I will put my law within them. It says, I will put my teaching into their inmost being. And you can go all day and philosophize about what is, what is the inmost being. It, I think it's something that all of us understand. There's this inner you that is distinct from this body, this fleshly thing that we have. And, it, and God says, I like this translation, I will put my teaching into their inner person, into their inmost being. Elsewhere in Jeremiah, the next chapter, verse 37 through 41, it starts out like this. Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath, and in great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Pause right there. Jeremiah is prophesying a future restoration event. God's going to bring back the people, and he, they will be my people. Now he's going to characterize what does this people look like? I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I'll make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. I will rejoice over them to do them good and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. God says in verse 39 that people would be distinguished by one heart. I want to emphasize the one there, one heart. We are united in this way. To say that there's one and there's this singularity, there's unity there. There's something similar that's the same about you and I, God's people. There's a common characteristic, and it has something to do with the heart. What about Ezekiel? Ezekiel had something to say about this as well. Chapter 11, verses 19 through 20. I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. Now we get this idea of a new spirit. I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people and I will be their God. Again, Ezekiel describes the one heart. God's people would be recognized by their heart. And you think about the significance of that compared to what the standard was. God's people in those times was understood in what way? Your lineage your ancestry, who your mom and dad was, what your bloodline was, maybe a physical mark of circumcision. But now God's people would be recognized by nothing physical. It has purely to do with your inmost being, your inner person. It has to do with your heart. And uh, what about this heart? What's it like? Well, a little bit of information here in verse 19. It says that it's a heart of flesh. And you think to yourself, what is this heart of flesh? It's sort of poetic language, but he contrasts it with a heart of stone. And that gives us an idea of what he's talking about. I will give them a soft heart. God's people are characterized by a soft heart, not a hard heart, one of stone, because if a heart is soft, it's moldable. It can be manipulated. God can change that into what he needs it to be for his service, whereas if you have a stubborn heart, if someone has a hard heart, one that can't be changed, um, well, then they're gonna, it's going to struggle to listen and adhere to what God has to say. Ezekiel says in chapter 18, verse 31 and 32, Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. Eighteen chapters later, Ezekiel 36, 26, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. These prophetic writers are, are hammering this concept. It's a really important one and clearly one that's going to uh, be a part of this future establishment. So, so far, what does, the, what does it mean to have the law written on the heart? There's a couple things that we can glean just from what we've read so far from Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel. For sure, it has to do with the inmost you. What was translated, uh, it was translated that way in the in the JPS Tanakh translation. In particular, in particular, a transformation of the inmost you. It's going to change you and your character. It is characterized by a reverence for God or a fear for God, a respect for God. It's characterized by a soft heart as opposed to someone who is hard-hearted and certainly repentance, which we saw in Ezekiel chapter 18. And all of these things are connected. A person who is willing to repent is willing to admit that they... Uh, are wrong. It is a penitent person, and that is a soft heart. So all of these things are, are connected. Now, this is from the major prophets, but really the crux of the matter is an old concept. 
Um, God has always been interested in the heart. It, it is not exclusively something that's a New Testament concept. In, um, let's see, in 1 Samuel we see this. Um, Samuel, you'll recall, was ready to look for a replacement for uh, King Saul. And God told him, go and look for this. You'll find this king. He's one of the sons of Jesse. And so Samuel goes and he meets one of Jesse's sons. His name was Eliab. And he thinks, man, you look like a king. I'm looking at you. I, you look like a king. And God says, well, here, here's the, uh, the interaction here in 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 7. The crux is this. God says, um, I'm not looking at the appearance. My criteria has to do with the heart. When they entered, he looked at Eliab, that's Samuel, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God has always been concerned with the heart. Even in the law of Moses, this is Deuteronomy. This is Torah. Deuteronomy 10.16, so circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. They were given this command even in the old times. And of course, they corrupted it and, and eventually pursued an external service. Um, but this is a similar commandment that we're given. In Romans chapter 2, 28 through 29, Paul says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Jew means someone of Judah. Judah means one who praises God. Previously, they thought the people of God had to do with your lineage. I'm from the tribe of Judah. I'm a Jew. But Paul is saying the people of God, those who praise God, is an inward thing. It's based on an inward criteria, a circumcision which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. This concept of contrasting between the spirit and the letter is not one that Paul uh, only does here. We will look at another instance where he talks about this idea. Another place in Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. We remember what Jesus had to say about this verse, right? Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Matthew twenty two thirty eight. He said, this is the great and foremost commandment. And then in the next verse, verse 39, he says, and the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says in the next verse, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. When Moses says, write these words on your heart, Jesus says those words summarize the law. The concept is not exclusively talking about something that Jeremiah prophesied would characterize the people in the future. It was supposed to then. The law was supposed to be on their heart, something that they internalized within themselves. Uh, beyond this, Jesus had a lot to say about the heart. Um, and if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. I just want to, I didn't put up a bunch of verses on the screen here. If you have your Bible, you can uh, scroll with me through it. I want to survey what Jesus had to say about this matter. If you take nothing else from this lesson, what does it mean to internalize the truth of God? What does it mean to have the law written on your heart? Just meditate on what Jesus had to say about this. If there were ever a preacher that hammered this concept, it was Jesus. So look at this with me. Many of what we call the Beatitudes describe a person's character. We'll look at some stuff uh, from the Sermon on the Mount first. The Beatitudes characterize a person's character, and this is what Jesus led off with in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is an internal quantity. Look at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Later in the same sermon, this, uh, this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus described an internalization of the Old Testament commands. He took these thou shalt not commands that were written with letters on stone, and he, he preached that they should be internalized, something that a person was concerned with far more than uh, just the command itself. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. You've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry 
with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. It has more to do with, it's more than just you get so angry with someone that you murder them. Follow that back to its source. It's the anger that's the problem. Look at verse 27 and verse 28. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a, at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Having a heart for God is an internal matter. It's contrasted with a person who is concerned merely with looking the part. Jesus had a lot to say about this. Flip over to Matthew chapter 6. Read verses 1 through 6 with me. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray... Don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Because the concept here is the same as the concept that God was trying to get across Samuel, Samuel's head back in 1 Samuel. I don't see things like you do. You look at the outside. The Pharisees sought to sought the approval of men. They sought to appear righteous, to look righteous. But God sees beyond that, which is so often fake. And he sees your heart, which will manifest in those things. But only you know your heart and God. Look at verse 16 and 17 of, of Matthew 6. Whenever you fast, don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Flip over to Matthew chapter 7. Look at 21 through 23. You know, if we judge based on the appearance, if we consider a person righteous because of how they appear to be, there's a level of that person that none of us can see. And what Jesus is going to talk about here in 21 through 23, there may be a surprise about who ends up not being with God eternally because of their motivations for why they did what they did. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? People saw me prophesy. And in your name, didn't we cast out demons? People saw me do this. And in your name, we performed many miracles. God, don't you know that my reputation was that I was one of your followers? Just ask anybody. They know. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There will be many people who would like to point to external service, but God didn't have their heart. Only you can answer this question this morning, but God knows. Jesus often used the Pharisees as a counterexample to this point. If you flip over to Matthew chapter 15, Look at an instance here, Matthew chapter 15. Now what's going on here is the Pharisees are criticizing Jesus because he didn't wash their hands. He and his disciples didn't wash their hands before they eat. Okay, in Matthew, Matthew 15 verse 2 it says, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat bread. So this was a tradition, it wasn't a commandment. Maybe it's good practice. You know, it's probably good hygiene to wash your hands before you eat. But the reality is it was not a commandment of God. And the Pharisees had gone beyond what was the commandment, and they had made restrictive where God was not restricted. They were enforcing something that God had never said to enforce. And so Jesus has this to say. He gets to uh, the heart of the matter, pun intended, in verse uh, 7 through 11. He says, you hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Same concept we've been talking about. People can hear what you say, and you might appear to be righteous, but your heart is far away from me. You and I might not be able to see that. People may not be able to see that, but God does. 
In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And after Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand, it's not what enters the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. And the disciples asked more clarification on this parable later in verse 15. And in verse 17, he gives the answer. Don't you understand that what goes into the mouth passes through the stomach and is eliminated? These are the physical things. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those are what defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, fault witness, slanders. If you get the heart right, you will necessarily fix the other thing. You can attempt to appear to do all these things and attempt to appear righteous, but God sees the heart. And if you get the heart right, well, the fruit of the Spirit is produced. We'll talk about that concept in a moment. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. As a final example, flip over with me to Matthew chapter 23. Jesus had a ton to say about this concept. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 25. This is where he's given those woes to the Pharisees. Woe are you Pharisees, uh, hypocrites. This is verse 25. For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which on the inside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, in saying all of this, in shifting our focus from an external service to an internal service, the point is not that what we do doesn't matter. In fact, you know, Jesus says in verse 26 there, clean the inside of the cup so that the outside may become clean also. He said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you too cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But the key point is this. It has to do with your motivation. Okay, um, the, the motivation for the Pharisees was external. And Jesus condemned the Pharisees for seeking the approval of men. Everything that they, doing was, everything that they were doing that they would call righteous, that they were doing to obtain a reputation, it says they did it to be noticed by men. Instead, Jesus calls for action that was motivated from a pure heart. Service has to start on the inside. And a concept that appears very frequently in the Bible is uh, this analogy of fruit. And it's really a perfect example in, the, in getting this across. Consider this scenario. Someone comes along and gives you a plot of land. And they employ you to grow for them apple trees. And they don't want orange trees, but there happens to be some orange trees on this plot of land. Now then, the boss goes away and he says, I'm going to come back in a year and I want to see all apple trees. So now a year comes by and he, and he comes back ready to see it. Now, how are you going to satisfy your boss? There's a couple ways you could go about trying to satisfy your boss. One is to uh, go to all the, apple, uh, the orange trees and paint all the oranges red. That's one solution, right? And hopefully, if your boss stands way far away, maybe he's like, oh, excellent job, right? Those look like apples. In just a year, you were able to grow this big old tree and have, and have tons of apples. Great job. But if the boss takes any bit of a closer look, if he wants an apple tree so that he can eat an apple, he's going to be very disappointed when he takes a bite of that, that, <laughs> that red-looking orange, right? And, and the idea is clear here. Now, why might a person try to paint these oranges red? Why might the Pharisees try to appear to be an apple tree when they're really an orange tree? And I'm just using an example here. Because it's easier. Because these roots are deep for this orange tree. And to go and dig that thing up, you've got to take every ounce of what was that orange tree and get rid of it. And the same is true for you. This is life-changing stuff. To follow Jesus means take up your cross and you kill your former way of life. You're going to have to do a lot of work and dig deep. You don't just cut the trunk. You don't just paint oranges red. You've got to pull out all the nasty roots and change your entire life 
kill that old way, and then work the soil, plant the seed of an apple tree. And you know what happens when you plant seeds? It grows. People water, but God brings the growth. And this natural process is so powerful, right? Because it, it points our focus to the right place. Get to the heart of the matter. Plant the seed of the word of God. Work on your heart that it be the type it was said in the prayer this morning. Give us a heart and a mind to listen this morning. And I'm right there with you trying to understand this. The word is there. The seed is there. Work on your heart so that you have a chance to be transformed and be what we need to be. Jesus talked about this, right? We think about the parable of the sower. The seed is the word of God. And it's there. It's there ready to produce. But you got all these different soils. What type of soil is your heart? Is it the good soil? There's a lot of different soils that will choke it out. That it never has a chance because it's hard-hearted. This was the heart of flesh that Ezekiel and Jeremiah were talking about. The fruit identifies the tree. I'll flip back over to Matthew 7 and read this one. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 through 19. It says, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you'll know them by their fruits. If we seek the heart, the right heart, and if the Spirit of God truly dwells within us, then it will be manifest in the fruit that we produce. And hopefully this is the fruit of the Spirit, what's described in Galatians 5.22. And sometimes we need to just read that and dwell on that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law written on the heart means that you have internalized the truth of God, the teachings of Jesus. And in doing this, our service to God becomes more than just checking off boxes of apparent righteousness. You see what I'm saying? There are these, there are these ideas that people associate with righteousness, and we put a box beside it, and we want to check it off. What appears righteous? Maybe going to church. right? So we check off that box, go to church on Sunday, but then we never open our Bible again until the next Sunday. We're at lunch and there's people around, so we close our eyes, bow our heads, say a prayer so that we can build up a reputation, but we never want to dive into a deep conversation. We never go to God in prayer uh, when we're struggling with sin. This is to seek, This is to serve God in order to be approved by men. This is to serve God so that we can have a certain reputation. And certainly, we ought to be, uh, we ought to be Christians by our reputation for sure. But what we're talking about is not something that you would be able to judge, perhaps. Sometimes it'll show up, right? A person's heart sometimes will show up when things get tough. But God knows your heart, and so do you, if you're honest with yourself. We seek to serve God in spirit. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that our spiritual service of worship is presenting our bodies as living and holy sacrifice to God, and that this would be our acceptable service. And he tells us how to do that in the next verse, to be transformed by renewing your, of your mind. And in doing this, you will not be conformed to the world, you will be different. To change who you are, to be transformed, is to change the way that you think. The, the word mind there is, comes from the Greek nous. It means uh, your reasoning faculty. Literally, the way you make decisions is going to have to come from a different source. You're going to have to change the way that you have always done it when you were a kid growing up because every baby reacts naturally to physical phenomena and physical processes that happen. You get hungry and you just act naturally. But these things don't go away as we get older. You get mad and you just do stuff. You lust and you just do stuff. And you have to reason differently, not according to the flesh. You have to go back to the source, which is the Bible. Every time and you say, I'm going to make decisions based off of this. And that will change you. You'll be transformed if you renew your mind in this way. And any transformation is impossible without a soft heart. 
Recall Paul's words in Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The letter there is a reference to the law that was written on stone, literally with letters. And in the oldness of the letter, I think, is a reference to how the people of the day were living out that in a way that they shouldn't have, but it was in the oldness of the letter is to seek righteousness on your own terms, to seek righteousness uh, via what people would see, by the things that you do. And Paul contrasts that idea with service in the newness of the spirit, a service which is internally driven. And this is, again, everything is internally driven. What's our motivation in this? Where does all of this stem from? It's motivated by love. You always come back to this if you need motivation. We love because He first loved us. 1 John 4.19 And we have a weekly reminder of that one. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. A weekly reminder for this one. The love of Christ controls us from the inside. It's an internal concept, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.14. So hopefully this has provided some idea of what it means to have the law written on your heart and to serve in the newness of the Spirit. Now what we're saying this morning is not that you'll be perfect. That certainly is, is not the idea here. Remember we talked about earlier Samuel's search for a king. He was looking for Saul's replacement and... God had to tell him what his criteria was, not what he looks like. It's got to do with his heart. And in 1 Samuel chapter 13, 14, he describes that heart. I'm looking for a replacement that's going to be after my own heart. God was looking for a king that would be after his own heart. We all know who he chooses. It was David. Now, David was far from perfect. And in a way, I'm thankful. In a way, I'm thankful because I'm just as messed up as David. Everybody's just as lost as David ever been, ever, ever had been as well. But the key point is this. How did David respond when he realized that there was sin in his life? When he realized there was a thing that needed to be changed, how did he respond? Not like Saul did when Samuel approached him, when he had taken things, when they defeated the Amalekites that he wasn't supposed to, and he made excuses like, oh, we're, we're giving sacrifices. This is 1 Samuel 15. And he made excuses and made excuses, but... When David committed adultery with Bathsheba and Nathan through the parable brought, brought to his knowledge his sin, his response uh, is recorded for us, the idea of it in Psalm 51, 10 through 12. Look at what David says. Create in me a clean heart, O God. I am broken and dirty inside. You know, was David's concern with all these people are going to disrespect me now because of my reputation? It seems to me his response is fix me on the inside. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. A steadfast spirit, one that's going to last. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. I love that last line. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Right now, in the heat of the moment, David's saying, I'm willing, God. Keep this with me. Sustain me with this motivation with this attitude and every morning that we wake up i hope we can say the same thing hopefully we all share this attitude this morning so you have to answer for yourself is your heart right with god this morning let's sing our song